the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening. My name is Robert Gilson. I direct the Arts Center at the 92nd Street Y. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with our programs, we offer over 100 courses and workshops per semester in fine arts and fine crafts for adults, children, and teens. Um, this lecture is presented by the uh, Center for Adult Life and Learning here at the Y, and uh, other upcoming programs in the series um, include tomorrow evening, um, and this is quite an extra extraordinary title, uh, The Great American Experiment Continues Diversity and Tolerance in American Life, and that's moderated by Rabbi Mar Mark Schneer, uh, with pan panelists Betty Bow Lord, Stanley Crouch, and Herman Bedillo. Um, next week on April 16th, Susan Sontag will have a conversation uh, with Van Vanity Fair senior editor uh, Robert Walsh. Um, for information about these programs and all the programs here at the Y, I'd like to refer you to uh, the whole Y catalog available in the lobby when you leave. Um, our program this evening with artist William Wegman marks the third in this year's Artist Vision series. Uh, the, next lyric, the next lecture in this series will be on April 21st with um, artist Terry Winters and um, will be followed uh, by Tina Barney on May 11th and I hope you'll join us for those other two lectures. Our moderator this evening is, as always, Nan Rosenthal. She's asked me to be brief, so that's all I'm going to tell you this evening. And uh, the format for the program, and for those of you who have heard this over and over, please forgive me, uh, will be as follows. Uh, Nan Rosenthal will introduce William Wegman. Mr. Wegman will then give a slide presentation about his work and ideas. Um, at the end of the lecture, there will be a brief pause while the stage is reset up. Then Mr. Wegman will be uh, joined on stage by Nan Rosenthal for an informal discussion. Um, the discussion will be followed by a question an answer period of um, uh, questions from the audience that uh, Nan Rosenthal will uh, select and present to Mr. Wegman. And uh, if you have any questions, please write them on the index cards you received from the ushers upon entering. Um, this evening should uh, certainly offer some uh, fertile opportunities for questions. And uh, so we look forward to your uh, most creative uh, suggestions. Um, and the ushers will collect cards uh, at the end of the slide presentation. So the other thing that we ask is that you please write legibly. Uh, you know, those of you who are uh, adept at cuneiform or whatever, uh, we, really, we really need your cooperation. It's hard to read them up here. So thank you for coming. And uh, please help me to welcome Nan Rosenthal, who will introduce William Wegman. Thank you, Bob. William Wegman was born in 1943 in Western Massachusetts and raised there. From the time he was very young, he wanted to be an artist. After high school, he obtained a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Massachusetts College of Art in Boston, where he did a great deal of reading as well as studying art and uh, all of the media. He then got an MFA at the University of Illinois in Ch at Champaign-Urbana, and in 1967, moved to Wisconsin, where he taught at several campuses of the State University. At this time, uh, he was, as he's described himself recently, a 60s minimalist conceptualist, and he was using a camera to document actions and pieces, such as floating a chain of styrofoam commas down the Milwaukee River. Uh, as, as I believe he will explain to us, uh, in an epiphanic moment, he began to use photographs as the works of art themselves, not just for the purpose of documenting an action. Around the same time, he began to make videos. In 1970, Wegman moved to Los Angeles, in part for a teaching job at Cal State Long Beach, and the same year, he acquired a Weimaraner puppy, whom he named Man Ray, after the great American Dadaist photographer and friend of Duchamp. Soon Man Ray began to appear, Man Ray the dog, began to appear <laughs> <laughs> in 
in Wegman's still photographs and videos, impersonating the behavior of humans and other animals with a blend of dignity and elegance that was both hilarious and very moving at the same time. An early patron of these photos was Holly Solomon, then a collector, now one of Wegman's art dealers in New York. In the early 1970s, Wegman also took up drawing on eight and a half by 11 typing paper with a number two pencil and often watercolor. In the course of the 1970s, he shuttled between Los Angeles and New York, settling finally here, where he has several studios. Uh, he also has a house and studio in Maine, in the woods, uh, and in Columbia County in upstate New York. In 1979, Wegman was one of a handful of artists whom Polaroid invited to try out its new large format camera, which takes 20 by 24 and a half inch, 24 inch color photographs. Uh, though uh, Wegman was hesitant at first, this proved very fruitful, and it also provided a new experience for him of working collaboratively with technical assistants, models, lighting specialists, cameramen, and so on, uh, human collaborators, uh, as opposed to solely canine ones. Wegman had his first retrospective exhibition at the Walker Art Center in 1981. The following year, at the age of 12, Man Ray died. In the mid-1980s, Wegman began painting again for the first time since art school, and this is ongoing. Uh, and quite fascinating. Uh, they, there are these translucent layers of stained color uh, as a ground, and then cityscapes, farmscapes, industrial landscapes, uh, futuristic worlds sometime. And they are peopled with figures and buildings that are rendered in a kind of, uh, I brought some students of mine there recently, and we decided it was goofy doofy uh, lightness, reminiscent really of his drawings. Uh, a selection of these, along with Wegman's videos, drawings, and photographs, are on view in his second retrospective. Uh, after five stops in European cities and two in the United States, this show is on view at the Whitney Museum uh, here in New York until April 19th. After some mishaps in acquiring a new dog, Wegman was offered a female Weimaraner puppy, Cinnamon Girl, while lecturing in Memphis. He brought her north and renamed her Fay Ray. She too likes to pose. At present, Fay and her daughter, Batina, known as Batty, as well as Batty's brother, uh, who logically enough belongs to Wegman's sister. Um, I feel destined to play the straight man this evening. Uh, all, all three are starring in the first of a series of narratives, Fay's favorite fairy tales. The first is Cinderella. Uh, I was fortunate enough to visit the Cinderella set last week uh, in uh, Wegman's studio on Bond Street, and I was fascinated both by uh, the various Ray's ability to concentrate and by the patience required to keep three dogs in a pose at the same time. I am very delighted to present William Wegman. Uh, <clears throat> um, this is the slide part of the talk, and the slides will appear on this screen, so if you focus your attention there while I talk, <laughs> you'll be able to. Uh, uh, Nan has, has uh, said almost everything that I really want to say about my early life. You can read about the rest of, of me in so many different magazines, it's not funny. Um, including New York Magazine. Let's see, I want to start with a slide, uh, which should come up soon, again, over here. I, I don't know how to work these things. I have a machine that's called Amy here. Oh, it's broken already. Okay. Just meditate for a while. There we go. Ooh, there it is. Worth waiting for. Um, I guess Nan already mentioned this eureka moment of coming from uh, documentary photography, my, my commas and words floating down the Milwaukee River to, to the moment where I said I'm not going to be 
making works that, that, uh, that cover this activity but are actually the work itself. And, and this was maybe not that moment, but it was one of the first moments of, I can, I can get away with, with just uh, making a work, making a set for a work, and then not having it around. I didn't go around all day showing this little BB to everyone. I, I just made a photograph of it. And, um, and all of the photographs at that time, uh, this looks really big, I know, but it's, it's really 11 by 14. And my ideas about scale were that uh, if I made everything 11 by 14, it could be when it got into a magazine, because remember I was working in Wisconsin at this time, um, that it could be seen by a lot of people and wouldn't lose itself. If you saw this picture as it is now in a magazine or on a wall as an artwork, you would still get it. Um, and now this was in the milieu of a lot of uh, site-specific installation work that I was really reacting against. Um, everyone was doing, including myself right before this, uh, floor pieces, corner pieces, outdoor pieces. Um, people were flying in airplanes doing air pieces. And it was during the, uh, the peace movement of the 60s that... Um, <laughs> so I just got pieced out and uh, wanted to do them, do, do just uh, these things, which really didn't have, I thought, a strong place and sight uh, aspect to it. And also, I could communicate with a much larger audience than I was finding in rural Wisconsin and uh, by being reproduced in magazines. At the same time, part of my eureka moment was turning to video, which could also, I thought, be... Uh, be broadcast. I wasn't doing video installation or sculpture, but uh, video just just like TV. Uh, not that I had any any uh, what I felt was much chance of being broadcast, and and at that time um, it, it was still intrigued me that I could avoid this this problem of uh, communication to a larger audience and also to a real annoyance of, uh, of scale. Everyone that was working in the Midwest wanted to get attention, and they were making works larger and larger and larger. So you would, I, I would hear artists coming back from a group show saying, oh, I really I control that wall, or I blew the, everyone else out of the museum, or there's this, this dominance through scale, and I thought that I could do very small things, but, you know, si sidestep that issue. And also, I didn't really want to have to do this uh, before anyone. I was somewhat shy at the time, so uh, I could do this before a camera. It was much easier for me to function in front of a video camera without any audience, or uh, I did all of these pictures, with few exceptions, myself, uh, with a remote um, Um, this, I suppose, uh, in a way, this almost look. This looks more documentary, or it could be a photo of a uh, of a sculpture called the Barcelona Chair. But I guess it's in this talk because it shows my interest in language and chairs <laughs> and Barcelona, which is a important place this year. So it's relevant to show now. <laughs> These are, I guess this comes out of that era too when, when everyone was, uh, was at least thinking about bombs being the, the uh, you know, the weathermen and SDS and so forth from that era. So this was elements of a bomb. And most of my elements, I might add, don't have a lot to do with, uh, thought. They're just about what's around. Uh, you know, I do a little bit of shopping, but, but mostly it's just stuff I have around. <laughs> the photo timer I, was mine, the bowling ball, of course. Anyone who knows me knows that I always have a, bo a bowling ball with me, and, 
<coughs> Here we go. And and also interested in. Uh, Evidently, a lot of you identify with this picture. <laughs> um, stuff around the house. <laughs> Something else. This is, this is interesting because some of my work is funny and some of it isn't really funny. This is probably a, a more, in terms of 60s conceptualism, this is a better work than this one, which is, uh, this is funny and this one is less funny but more right, formally, I think, and, and fits that period better. But, okay, let's go back again. This is, uh, this is, stays funnier longer <laughs> than, uh, okay. And this is, uh, another thing that's, not so much, there's nothing really central to my work, um, but one of the things that I do is something really looks right and it should be right and based on all of the elements, formal elements, like, like that last one, let's go back to this one, um, it really makes sense that really makes no sense. Ooh, let's see, this is such a dirty slide. Um, it says, advice, and you see me with, uh, sitting at this booth with pieces of paper, then it says, lemonade, and I'm making um, uh, paper cups. Then it says, toy hats, and they look like little bishop's hats. And then it says, closed. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's relevant today in terms of the recession, but. <clears throat> I, didn't, I didn't really get what this work was about until right now. I mean, I made this in 1971, but now I get it, but I don't want to tell you what I'm thinking. I discovered that I could say to my dog, Man Ray, did you do that? And no matter what, he would say, yes, I did that. <laughs> and that I'm really sorry that I did it. <laughs> this is back during the time when, when I had spare time, when there was nothing really going on and there was nothing to do, so I made a work about that. What's on the agenda? Nothing. <laughs> oh, this is here because we're not gonna show videotapes tonight, and it's a still from um, one of the, the later videotapes, being uh, Reel 7, 1977, called um, the doctor joke, and the joke was about, uh, um, let's see, something like, uh, I'm, a, I'm a female patient, and, uh, and I'm not having any fun in life. Uh, what, what should I do? And the doctor said, just, just uh, have a ball, get it? <laughs> and the dog was supposed to get it, but he doesn't get it because he doesn't want to violate my my space there, so he just looks at me, not getting it, and he never gets, he never gets the joke. <laughs> and this is one where I'm, I'm trying to teach him how to smoke, and uh, I'm telling him just to take the cigarette and try it, and he says no, and I say, how do you know if you haven't tried it? It might be good, and he, he actually says no, like that, so he tries to smoke, but he, he doesn't. It's a good dog. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, now I'm starting to get into trouble with cuteness. I can hear that. Here, uh, 
This is a, the alarm goes off, and because I rehearsed this so many times with him, he wakes up, yawns, and goes back to sleep in this version. <laughs> And this is a sequence. No, I'll do that again. It looks like I'm going to reveal, as in magic, something interesting, but uh, nothing really happens except, like, obliquely. And uh, this is a dialogue about horseshoes and baseball, which, which one prefers. And it seems that baseball is better because it's, it involves camaraderie. <laughs> and now these are the, the 8 by 10 drawings on typing paper that Nan referred to. And the reason for that was I didn't want to get involved in painting, which I had announced to myself was dead, and I wanted these to be um, still kind of connected to minimal and conceptual art, which I thought myself as. Is that right? Is that a sentence? <laughs> Cloudy and clear liquid, get it? It's because it's cloudy liquid because you don't see the, the bottom uh, ellipse there on the left glass. And it's clear because you can see it, so. And this is uh, rivers and buckets. So Amazon is the largest, and it gets the biggest bucket. And the Hudson is down there. I don't know what the smallest one is anymore. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. Double profile. United Faiths. And what's strange about this is it really looks quite ordinary and not at all um, wrong, except that they're united around a symbol of, you know, the words there. Oh, you get it. You get it now. A lot of times I, my work is, I think it's really clear, because that's what I wanted it to be. I wanted it not to be just interesting or a nice shape or any of those subjective things. I wanted you to really, back then, I don't care anymore, but then I wanted it to be gettable. And so a, a work like, like, like the previous one, I think really is, and this is, Certainly, you understand it isn't really about positive and negative shapes, although that's that's there. And this, you really, I mean, it's it's uh, it's not about abstract issues. <laughs> there, there are a lot of. Other allusions, I suppose, to uh, futurism as well as, uh, you know, the um, futurism, I guess, is the, is the main one here. And this is a really good introductory drawing, I think. And it's, it's how I feel most of the time. in how I want you to feel towards me. <laughs> a guy liked Dondi, but I didn't want to be sued for plagiarism, so the disclaimer is it's not Dondi. I'm not trying to appropriate Dondi. But it is a Dondi-like drawing. You must, you must agree. Now, what is Dandi like about this? Perhaps that could, could be the discussion later. <laughs> <laughs> A 
Now, this is a good one for art historians, I think. Notice this. <laughs> now the drawings are, are no longer from the, um, these aren't from the early 70s, they're probably late 70s now, and um, they, they're likely to be up until the, the late 80s or even 90 because it's not something that I, I no longer do the uh, many of those early like looking black and white photographs but I keep doing these drawings and and I'm not really sticking to that type of pencil anymore this is a this is what happened to those photographs they, they got painted on and I call these works altered photographs I guess this is supposed to be in focus by itself, huh? Now this is a period in, in my work which is starting to not be quite so clear what's going on and quite really not all that friendly either. Uh, more hermetic, more um, well, hermetic is a good enough word. It's not cheerful, really, it's pl it, and it's not even playful. Well, it doesn't involve much whimsy, but it involves a sort of lack of cheer. I'm depressing myself for no reason. <laughs> this is whimsical. This is really funny. This is fun to do. <clears throat> and now this is, we're back to something whimsical here. I painted little boots on this fellow. It says, don't walk, shoe repair. Um, and I don't know why I took this picture, but I think it had to do with me getting a grant and getting an, a Hasselblad. And I used to use a twin lens camera, which took much longer to set up. And I was much more careful about uh, uh, composition and what I photographed. And the Hasselblad was sexy, it was fun to use. So I took a lot of pictures with it. This asked the question, what is Softex, a kind of tissue? <laughs> and uh, this might have to do with, with uh, fading memory, memory loss. This, this one has got some references. Again, most of my earlier work had, didn't deal with art so much. Uh, it, I thought that that was too uh, in-house uh, a subject for me, but this really deals with Donald Judd and a kind of anachronism because you have a very early TV set and then a, like a, a much later clicker to make the TV and then you have this tortoise which lives a long time, so. And um, I guess a lot of my work asks questions. Where's Dean? <laughs> Back to some sort of whimsy here. You know, humor in art was uh, a... <clears throat> I, I know there are exceptions, but, but before me, humor in art tended to be Paul Clay, which you would go back to, uh, to, to this as sort of Paul Clay-like, or Miro, this could be. Sort of a Miro put, put in a parking lot.
And I'm starting to involve myself in controversy now, too. Another, another example of middle-aged doubt, I think, here. These works are interesting in that they're impossible to show other than um, as you pass them to your friend because they're, they're cut and as soon as you mount them on the wall, they look like collages, the, the white from the wall or whatever shows through, but the eye is actually cut out of that. And um, I don't know, this doesn't really focus this, this device here. Maybe it's like a TV set where you... Thanks. There you go. That's better, huh? All right. If you, if you ha look at this picture while you're eating beef stew, it might help. <laughs> Probably by a campfire in the woods. Okay, and this is, uh, boy, this is the wrong slide tray. No wonder this talk is going downhill here. Bring me the head of big boy. <laughs> this is the, the cancellation of Chanel by Lysol. <laughs> Product wars. and foster parents. <laughs> this, is, this I think of as um, rather central to my work. I would call this a, a classic diptych. Um, it looks, you know, it's, it's, it's giving you something as um, very equal here. The, the left is equal to the right. And yet there's something fundamental and enormous about um, why it, it isn't equal, but it's presented as equal. And this is a more, uh, <laughs> this, this is like a non-classic diptych in that it's, um, it's an advance in time. It's like before and after. It's another type of thing, but it's, we'll go back to the other one, which is much more bound within itself. The left and the right are, are equal but not equal just because you have, to, you have to realize but you don't really care that this shot took much longer to prepare than, than that one. And this is the first picture I took after Man Ray died in 1982. I really didn't work with, with dogs for a while but Reluctantly, almost in 1987, I, I decided to, uh, to, to, um, I guess, t take the wrapping off Faye <laughs> and uh, start photographing her because, in a way, I felt that, uh, well, I did notice when I was taking casual pictures of her that she really liked being photographed. She liked that attention, or I, I felt that she, she was uh, different enough also. Uh, the way she held a page, and the way she looked to, to justify working with another Weimar on her. But it was really the last thing that I wanted to do, and it was, it was kind of like those parents that are actors that want to spare their children from going into acting, and they say, study law. So I wanted Faye to become not a, not a model, but she, <laughs> but she became that because she, was, she uh, qualified, I guess. And... Uh, if anyone knows, could we try to focus that again? Because it's set a little differently. 
if anyone knows uh, the corresponding picture to this with Man Ray and Hester, you could really see a strong difference between Man Ray, the male Weimaraner, um, and and also Man Ray was an old dog by the time he got to the Polaroid experience, and Faye was a young dog. So that's another thing. I'm working with a, a female that's also a young dog, and Man Ray was an old dog by the time he got to work in this. And so here she is as a the museum dog again. <laughs> and, then, and, and then she had a puppy. <laughs> and the puppy's name was Bettina, and I started to photograph her. And she would really watch her, her mother uh, pose and work, and when she, when she had her chance, she, she did very well. This is her and her mother doing what they do. Oh yeah, I show this because this was the last painting I did in 1966 um, at, in graduate school when I guess you know painting was really not the thing to be doing then, so I didn't do them anymore. <laughs> but then I wanted to paint again, and so. This is one of the first paintings I did 19 years later. And I guess in a way I picked up a bit from my drawings, but I soon felt that they shouldn't really be just large colored drawings. And the, the next few si slides will show this kind of searching for a reason to paint, given that there's, there is an inner need that I, that I had to do that. A double-barreled painting. And I think the dog is also a cat, so that's what I was thinking about here. A lot of the themes are similar to, to those that are in my drawings, except the grounds start to be much more, uh, I guess, uh, interesting. And my idea was I didn't have one kind of work where you were supposed to stand before it and see it. You really can't see a reproduction of my paintings and understand them. You, you, you have to be there looking at them, and you don't come away with a memory of them like you do with a photograph or the drawings, which are more get it oriented. Although, although the earlier ones like this tend to have um, that sort of uh, playful content. This is a reference to Monet, Mondrian, and other M.O. people. <laughs> uh, maybe de Chirico has got his little hoop, and he's behind the building doing something with a hoop. Um, various things on fire. Encyclopedic architecture. And to me, this is a, well, it's, it's a, it's like Impressionism, but it, or post-Impressionism, but it's like way post-Impressionism. But it's, an impo uh, it's to, instead of like imp with Impressionism, it reveals, this really disguises the subject. It's a, um, a, a rowboat coming upon a sunken ship. And it's a very clear painting that's in, that makes no sense, that's somewhat disguised by, by the uh, blue. Past and Futurama, where you have this New England village and a European, um, the past, and then the future, which is also very dated in about 1955. Uh, like a, a nouveau dinosaur. A lot of my th paintings have to do with dating, I suppose, and um, when it looks like it, it, it refers to what era, and it tends to get combined. This, this combines like cave painting references to animals with uh, cartoon images from the 50s to 
to rather uh, conventional naturalistic ones. So it really compiles in an encyclopedic way uh, representation. And this, gen is, this is almost like a computer-generated amateur watercolor painting from, uh, but it's painted in oils. And I started in the, the uh, lower right-hand corner with a painting that was willed to me by uh, an amateur painting painter, like a, a Rockport, Gloucester, Massachusetts painter of the little ro um, boat on the harbor. And then I just, ex I just kept going with what I thought the rest of the scene might look like. I think there are people that really struggle and search to, to, f to find what my painting has to do with photography, and it really has nothing to do with it, and that's why I do it. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it if, uh, if it did, and, but I, I just felt a need to not just keep photographing the dog, although I love doing that. It, it wasn't the, enough. And, uh, and I've only been painting really since art school, where I majored in painting, for about seven years, but I went to art school because I like to draw and paint, not because I like to make videotapes and photographs. And so I really, when I paint, I feel more like me than when I take a picture, which is uh, interesting to me. And again, it's much easier to show a slide of a, of a funny dog picture than it is a painting which has so many um, surfaces and every time you photograph my paintings they're notoriously difficult to photograph you only see one part it's almost like uh, I mean different things come out if I photographed it again although we could try to focus it and just see <laughs> there you go keep it going <laughs> anyway nevertheless this is the Lost Supper. <laughs> it focuses more on, it's from the Tintoretto and also the view of Toledo, kind of combined and merged into a, into a fungus. And it, uh, <laughs> it highlights the Roman rather than Christ. And there's nothing really, it just happened to work out that way. There's nothing uh, planned. And it's the last slide, I believe. I'll just look and see. It is. Thank you very much. Bill, I'm afraid I have a couple of dog questions to get out of the way, if that's all right. Okay. Uh, do Weimaraners have a special ability to hold poses? Yes. <laughs> I think it's because they're they're uh, they're meant they're bred to hunt. They they point and retrieve, and they can keep still for a long time. And most of the the jobs they have to do involve just staying in one place and and not getting moving around but it's extremely difficult for them to to move because they're usually up on something and they can fall down but since they they don't want to do that they stay and they also I've been so that's one of the reasons you use stools and things so that well I use stools if I want them to to be taller I mean you you saw that but um the hardest thing to do is to, to put them a dog in the middle of the floor without any points for them to stand on or to or to or any marks because they like to know what am I supposed to do and if you put them on a bicycle or something they know exactly what they're doing they're on a bicycle not falling off <laughs> That's, uh... but also they've been photographed so much they know that there's lights involved when the light goes off and we say uh, good dog that that it's done and then they run off and they go to their couch and hang out until it's time for the next picture and do you 
do you give them little goodies and things like that, or not so much? Uh, rarely, because you get these long strings of drool if you, use, uh, <laughs> if you want that in the picture. Oh, so they don't learn to expect that, and they just no, they just respond to attention. And, yeah. Uh, Were we using any goodies then, or not really? I, don't I think, think so. That, that, with Maybe with a newcomer. Difficult shot. Was yeah. that it? It was uh, your Better sister's. Rem- Dog. Yes. It was a little cheese you were using, which surprised me. Yeah, you gave away my secret. Say cheese. Eat cheese. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, could you tell uh, the audience a little bit more about the the new project? Um, Faye's. Well, I'm doing uh, Faye likes certain fairy tales, and she likes them because she she can play um, ugly mean stepmothers and fairy godmothers, and her daughter can play Little Red Riding Hood and Sweet Cinderella because they just look that way. And she told me that uh, she wants me to do this. This is like the son of Sam. He, he works the same way. She wanted me to finish it in a couple of years because she didn't want to play the grandmother. <laughs> You said you were going to use her in the frontispiece. She's going to be reading. Is that? Um, probably. You know, it's it's not done yet. Yeah. Just a completely different question. It seems to me that there was an apparent dearth of emotion in minimal art uh, and a lot of conceptual art. Mm-hmm. Um, though the absence, the absolute absence of emotion in minimal art was in its own way moving. Uh, did you use the dogs partly, uh, are they a way to bring uh, emotion uh, back into art while at the same time sustaining a sense of irony? Hmm. Well, they might do that, but I was, <clears throat> I was really adverse also to uh, autobiographical and self-indulgent performance art of the mm-hmm. early 70s and late 60s that um, I thought that using the self, which I was doing in, in video and, and photographs, needed some diffraction, some buffering. And when I used the dog or at least something else than myself, it took away this, took the edge off that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I wasn't very interested in um, in emotion then, and maybe I am interested in the dogs expressing emotion now, but it's, mm-hmm. it's a fake emotion. I mean, you interpret mm-hmm. and you construct the emotion that, that a dog in an anthropomorphic way has, which they don't really have. I mean, they're not really um, saying those things. It's us that are, are trying to get to, to read them that oh, way. Do you think there are there special problems, and if there are, would you talk about them? In is inherent in the fact that your work addresses such a wide range of audience. I mean, you're addressing sophisticated art audience at the same time. Mm-hmm. That the work's understood by a wide popular audience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That just sort of happened gradually, I think. Uh, my first interest was in having the work be really clear and understood because I was frankly lost. I didn't really know how to make another work. I didn't know when one work was finished and uh, and in the late in the late sixties, and I needed to to have that clarity for myself to say, "This is done. Now I'll do another one." And because of that, the work became gettable. Other people could get them as well as myself. And uh, somehow it became, some of them became funny. And then there was this, this interest in shows like Saturday Night Live to, uh, to, to work with. And um, opportunities sort of come and go as, as they did. Because I can't think of anyone else working today who has quite that range of... Well, there were artists ranges. like Laurie Anderson that, yes, that, were, that's a that was doing that, and there were artists that didn't do that but wanted to do that, maybe like Dennis Oppenheim, for mm-hmm. instance, was thought that was very interesting, and 
he, he didn't really have the, uh, <clears throat> his work didn't, although he wanted it to, uh, didn't really have what it takes to do that, and, and maybe that's good for him. <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, and mine, and it could be dangerous, does have what it takes if I wanted to, but there's always this uh, danger in, in it going that way. Too much that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It gets always misinterpreted, I think. And uh, one of the most annoying things is when someone shows me a dog picture that's not mine and they say, oh, I saw one of your things, uh. and it's hideous and awful, and I cringe because yeah, I sort of propagated some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Or I get blamed for every every picture with a gray dog in it, somehow <laughs> I'm supposed to have done. Do you think that the experience of being in California had anything important to do with the development of your work? I'm thinking of mm -hmm. artists there that I think you knew and admired, like Bruce Nauman and Ed Ruscha, people mm -hmm. with whom your work has something in common. Well, uh, I think that my work at that period had tended to have uh, t-shirts in it, and when I moved to New York, I'm usually seen in a sweater. But I liked, uh, the, the artists that I admired were uh, Ruscha, Nauman, and uh, Al Rupersberg. And oh, I know were, his work, yeah. 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 And they happened to be in, in the West Coast, so. Mm. I'm going to ask some of the audience questions now. Um, what is the reason for using the Polaroid 20 by 24 as opposed to other view cameras? Mm -hmm. Because uh, the Polaroid is instant, and it, I felt that it was a lot like uh, when I worked with video, where I could see it and and know immediately that it was that it was working or not, and you tend to just build the work that way. As you saw, when you watched us work, you could see it's not working, not working, not working. And then when it does, we can stop and go on. If you work with a view camera, you have to send it off, and the next day you'd get them back, and you'd realize that you overshot or undershot. Any advice for aspiring photographers? Get a dog. Get a, use the Polaroid camera. <laughs> <laughs> don't get a gray dog. <laughs> And there's a, in my tape, The World of Photography, there's a lot of tips. And I guess the most mm -hmm. important one is save your receipts. <laughs> that is and get a model release is very important too. For, if you're photographing people, get a release. That one is, is being shown at the Whitney. I think it is, yeah. yeah. I think so. Uh, well, this seems to be sort of a sequitur. Are, are there any other dog photographers that you like? Um, yes, there are. I, I like, um, someone said that there's only one good kind of picture. There are two, there are one kind of, two kinds of pictures. The, uh, one is, uh, has a dog in it, and the other is no good. So, uh, <laughs> there's a book called The Dog Observed. It has a lot of nice dog pictures in it. If you're, if you're interested in that, and I assume you are because you're here. You're all interested in dog pictures, otherwise you wouldn't have come to this talk. <laughs> what contemporary work or artists uh, do you like? I assume that means in addition to the ones we've been discussing. Uh, Bryce Marden. Okay. Um. <laughs> There's you a really that. <laughs> no, I don't know. I like a lot of I liked a lot of painting when I wasn't painting and uh I tend to not like people that whose work is a lot like me as much. I mean it's just sort of a I think it's a normal thing for you to have your area and when people are a lot like you to to be kind of wary of that. But I, I I'm often associated with uh, Baldessari and Akanchi and Oppenheim and Robert Cumming and Al Rupersberg and, uh, and many others. And the people that, uh, that I liked when I was a student were the generation ahead, which was uh, maybe Smithson and Saul LeWitt and uh, the, the minimalist and conceptualist mm -hmm. artists that I, I, I really looked to. Um, 
Lawrence Wiener, uh, mm -hmm. uh, lots of them. I don't want to to mm -hmm. confine it to one or two. Uh, um, I was really interested in the articles Smithson was writing in Art Forum in the '60s because mm -hmm. uh, because they were so gripping and so um, wrong at the same time and. Uh, Long in what sense? Well, they, they were pre pretending to be about entropy and thermodynamics, but, uh, but they weren't. And, and, but it was uh, interesting. Um, th there was an incredible interest in making something new, not basing it on something visual. To take something w with language and then um, see what it looks like later, or science, or anything, science. but not taking with oh, a kind of abstract painting that, that's uh, soft and pretty or wet or hard-edged or something like that, but to go with a word and then generate it into a picture or a science and generate it into a film or a sculpture. And that's what people like Smithson were doing and other conceptualists, Solowit, taking a, a mathematical uh, equation and then making a picture, not saying, I want to make a picture that looks like this, what can I what can I think up that will generate that? So it's a it's a really a different thing. It's a breaking from cubism, which was uh, started with Stella and uh, and just really happened in, in by the '60s, by the mid '60s. Mm -hmm. How to make an, uh, something new based not on something that was European art from the past. Mm -hmm. So I was one of those, I guess, that, that thought that was important. Um, this one says, hate to ask such a technical question, but how to lay down the background colors in your paintings? I think this is the type of question that when we break up into smaller groups, <laughs> um, See me after class. <laughs> um, you want a nasty one? I'm supposed, yeah. to, be, I'm supposed yeah. to be editing these out, the nasty, nasty ones. One. This is a nasty one. Um, it says, I know that person's handwriting. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> it says, Bill. It's intimate. Since your days in Madison, Wisconsin, you always made it clear that being a famous artist, that was in quotes, was what it was about for you. Without grant and corporate support and commercial success and fame, would you be making any of the art you showed tonight? I bet I know the answer. Yes. That's what I thought the <laughs> answer would be. I'm supposed to be screening those ads. That was just weird. That wasn't. Uh, <laughs> that was <laughs> could have been much meaner. I did much worse things in Madison, Wisconsin, than mm -hmm. express those. Here's another nasty one. <laughs> Are you getting back at me? No, no. I think we'll skip it. I'm doing my master's thesis on humor and art. Specifically, dogs as, oh, this is another after class. Specifically, dogs as humorous subject matter. You and Elliot Erwitt are the focus of my fourth chapter. <laughs> <laughs> is it possible to speak with you directly? Thanks. And then there's an asterisk which says this isn't a joke. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> How did your experience at MassArt influence you and your work? Mm -hmm. uh, MassArt at the time that I was there, in 1961 to 65, was uh, an art school that was trying to get um, a school in the suburbs, and so they had a, a dress code. You couldn't wear jeans or f have facial hair. <laughs> and uh, and you had to take a lot of different courses and go from nine to three. So I think because I couldn't do anything I wanted, I had to take a lot of courses. It makes me, that's why I do so many things now, because I didn't want to waste my education. I learned how to do ceramics, 
and architecture and uh, what, photography drafting? and drafting. drafting. Yeah, so I, every year I try to, to uh, utilize my education. <laughs> Painting, photography, architecture, sculpture, what English, made, what made you psychology, <laughs> philosophy, color, and I'm using it all now, etching. Have you made prints? I made prints, and I stuff, they end up in a box someplace, and uh, you never go in there. It's a, it's a weird thing. It's always fun to do. Them? You get this big stack, always. Huh. You just, I just make them, and I never show them. Um, I think that there, they used to be like some sort of a tax help back in the 70s, <laughs> and they, they did a, away with that, uh, with that loophole, and now you have all of these prints around. <laughs> Is, isn't it true? See, people know. <laughs> people don't even want them in benefits. They want original work. <laughs> and I'm going to be up in Ithaca at Cornell working on prints this month. Oh, you are working yeah. on prints there? Yes. Etchings? Yes. Uh -huh. Want to see my etchings? Sure. <laughs> um, will you show them? No. <laughs> what is Not unless they change the tax laws. <laughs> you mean in particular the law that uh, artists can't get deductions for giving things away? Um, there was something much more convoluted going on then, but I don't really remember it. I think I know what you mean. I think I know some people who got in trouble. In uh, deducting their investments in artist prints, which uh -huh. they then established were sold at high prices, and then they gave them to museums and took large tax deductions, which the IRS didn't like. There are several questions that about what is your most important technical discovery which you think might help other photographers and any, the, any advice for aspiring photographers in addition to mm -hmm. the second version of that? Well, um, lighting is important. <laughs> Do you want to amplify that? No. Uh, <laughs> No. <laughs> if you want to look scary, you light from below. If you want to look... Uh, <clears throat> there's a trick to make you look more handsome, is you leave, you take it with the strobes, you know, you're, on, you're up there, and you get hit with strobes, then you leave the camera on during ambient light and you move slightly, and it softens all of your, your features. <laughs> Now, what about uh, Dandi? You suggested that we should oh, the discuss, Dandi talk. discuss Dandi. Well, were there any questions from the audience about Dandi? There weren't. It was just my question. I made a note. Does anyone know who, uh, who was the author of Dandi? I don't. Is there uh, Dandi's Inferno or? <laughs> <laughs> that we've covered all the audience questions, except one I think you've answered in another way. Is it true that you will not do any more Weimaraner pictures? No, it's not true. No, it's not true. Not true. I'll do some more. Um, and here's one more. Uh, if a painting falls in the museum and no art historian hears it. <laughs> <laughs> Is it art? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Bill, thank you very, thank you. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for putting up in my wise box. <laughs> Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.